graveyard slot after lunch because it was thought that maybe I might be good to keep in your way. I haven't got this yet, but you do need to pay attention. There's a prize coming at the end, and there might be some questions. Different places you can start. 
Some people start with um, speech recognition in, in radiology work. Um, I think a good place to start is with a combination of templates, a clear case, and a document store. So those three kind of combined give you a good starting point. The templates with that integration gives you an immediate cost uh, saving because you're able to make your secondaries more efficient and not doing repetitive typing. You get the data right because it comes from PAS, etc. So you get an immediate, um, immediate uh, productivity benefit If you are saving, if you have documents in an electronic format, it's a great idea to put them into a document store. One of the things you should always think about in projects is clinician engagement. If you are going to people and asking them to change their working patterns, there's got to be a reason for doing it. And it usually boils down to a sort of value pain kind of relationship. Ideally, you have great value and low pain. You don't have to have that. Think back to texting. When texting first came out, it was really, really awful to go through the, 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 the numbers. We have smartphones now, it's a bit better. But it, because it's such a powerful, useful means of communication, it took off. So we need to think what in there is a uh, the reason for conditions to change. And the document store is a great example. Anna talked about the value of giving letters being not just for the recipients, but also for the people who wrote them. I have a kind of concept that some of you have heard before, of a poor man's EPR, and uh, if you have a score of your clinic documents, and you have a score of your discharge summaries, and you put them together and they're available electronically, then you kind of have a pretty good starting point for what's been going on with a patient. The discharge summaries summarise your inpatient activity, and the clinic documents summarise your outpatient activity. And that single factor was the driver for me to leave the register and move into this technology because I was frustrated with the city patients that we've been seeing for 10 years. And you have to say to them, well, you know, have we ever given you the orange pill or the one that you took once a week or something? Now, the Egyptians got that stuff right, but there are still situations today for complex cultural reasons where clinicians see patients without the notes. And that is obvious negative and safety effects. So, the framework is a good place to start on some productivity benefits. Document store, don't forget the value of importing any existing documents you have. It's really not a good idea to bring a new system in and take something away from users that they already have. Many trusts have been saving work files on a shared folder system across the trust. Now, there's all sorts of problems with that. We can get in and there's no audit trail and everything. You can't have them to change it, they will need some five that stuff. But don't knock it because it's a big step forward from having nothing at all. And when you move on to a better system, ideally, we'd like to import those. There's some engineering challenges around that, but we have some tools to do that, and I think with Suffer, we took five years of documents, 1.2 million, and imported them into the new system, which is an instant kind of draw for clinicians as to why they should use the new system. Plus, of course, reporting. So the engineering say, what gets measured, gets fixed. If you don't measure it, well, it's not science and it's all a bit of airy -bairy. So I put secretaries as my second item. I'm not sure what, what uh, word to use. What this is not is digital tapes. If you have just bought a digital system from whichever company, and all you have done is said, well, what we did before with analog tapes, we will now do it to a digital thing. Well, there are benefits. You know, clarity improves, you can report on it, you can track it, you can identify urgent stuff. But in terms of savings, you need to think about how you organise your workflow. Now, that might be channeling work in different directions. Identify the letters that are over target, you need to move them to someone else where there's more resource, etc. And a digital system gives you the chance to do that. It might be organising your working groups, the traditional relationship of one consultant to one secretary, or near that ratio, um, is great for consultants, but it's probably not the most efficient way to work. Um, you, we talked about the reporting, and then there's the question of restructuring. And 
number of trusts do sometimes quite significant restructuring of their medical secretaries, which results either in a, a, a reduction in headcount over, overall, or less attempts or bank staff, etc. And as with many businesses, saving people, rebuilding people, is you know, a, a, a very powerful way to um, reduce costs if that's what your that's what the objective is. What about the whole process, end to end, I call it? Well, we've heard some talk of secret targets and also some talk of turnaround time. It's important to realise that in the context of clinical document production, the bit that's important is not the typing time, but the end to end production time. Trust we're seeing now in our sequence, such as 72 hours, 48 hours in one case to deliver a clinic letter. That time is not how long did it take you to type it, it's how long is it from the clinic appointment to when we got into the GP. So there are some things you need to do that. Anna talked to us about the, um, the problem of the junior doctor who's on nights for a week, or you might have a visiting consultant who only comes once a week. And if you do electronic approval, the big thing about that is it can be done anywhere at any time. One of the patterns we see is that you know, the consultant has got five minutes there in the clinic, they'll do a few letter approvals because they're all there on the system for them. It's not actually any quicker for them to do the act of approval, it's no slower either, but the task, the elapsed time, tends to, to go down. And then after electronic approval, the last stage is finishing that trough and sending it out electronically. If you've got a 72, 48 hour delivery time, you've really got to have an electronic distribution mechanism. And there's a range of ways of doing that. It is possible to do it by uh, secure fax and HS fax and mail, and we have a, a component that does that. And there's a range of other more complex solutions from portals to PCCI, Dotman, <coughs> pathology messaging service, etc. And we support all of those. Monitor, monitor reporting, again, that's in there. If you don't measure it, you don't know if you're improving. And we talked about the sequence. And then I put down what I call the no audio type. Sometimes secretaries can feel threatened by the new system, say, oh, we're going to lose our jobs or whatever. Well, you know, there can be an element of that. But probably the way to pitch it is that audio typing is not the most rewarding job, and neither is it the best use of a, a, a medical secretary's time, especially an experienced medical secretary. Experienced medical secretaries, I'm delighted to say, we have Margo from Leeds in the back, who was my first ever medical secretary when I was practicing in Leeds, do a lot more things than just typing letters. There's the whole question of answering the phone to patients, organising their consultants, making sure the department is uh, running smoothly, being a gatekeeper, etc. So if you can take some of the audio typing out, you're freeing up their time to work, to do things uh, that they're really needed for. And there's two ways that you can do that to remove audio typing. Um, outsourcing is one option, speech recognition is another, and I think you're going to hear about that. Um, later. Okay, so we looked at a number of these areas. Now we look at the framework, secretaries, uh, end to end uh, stuff, end to end uh, process. Let's see how some of that might work in practice. So I'm going to show you some technology now. It is our product, but there are plenty of other ones out there. So if I'm in clinic and I want to dictate, I probably want to detect quite quickly because I'm an impatient person. That's just normal for clinicians. I've got a list of all my clinics here and I'm going to pull up one and I've got a list of my patients. We've pulled information from different sources, from the past, there's various things going on there, alerts, etc. We've integrated perhaps with a patient self-checking system to see which patient has arrived. And I want to dictate a letter. So, I'm going to start off dictating. I'm going to be using a Philips speech mic. Now, I like these. I, I, I don't really want to say I'm putting product out of you, but I have to say we have the nice man from Philips, Neil Dunham here. And last year, he saw me using one of these, which was a model that was about five years old. He came to me and said, Why are you 
everything on all stuff. I've been showing off on new stuff. So I very cheaply said, well, if you want to send me a new one, I'll use it. So actually, uh, I am. And um, uh, I understand that uh, Philips make quite nice colour TVs and DVD players, and my TV is not so great. So for next year, if, if you could uh, help me out with that, that, that could be good. So I'll uh, do my dictation. Now, apologies to Anna because this is a pretty letter, but it's possibly not as, uh, for this purpose, it's not as, uh, the context is it's not as uh, good as it could be. I reviewed this lady in the clinic today, full stop, new paragraph. She remains well with no symptoms, full stop, new paragraph. I have not arranged to see her again, but will be happy to do so at request. So I will send off my letter. And there it is. Well, but thank you, Nurse James. He's interrupted my day. You have met James Wilson before. He's the newly appointed info product specialist. And um, I think you were trying to tell me that, uh, that Joe Boggs has, has turned up. Is he dying? Does he need to be seen now? Right. Can I pass some notes? What did you say his name was? Joe Blocks. That might be him. Okay, so we didn't have any clean notes, but I can find out what's going on. This is the power of the document store. I can look at all my letters and see what's going on. And that is a very powerful um, a tool, a very attractive clinician in those occasions when the patients just turn up for whatever reason, we don't have the notes. And was there anything else that I let you perhaps is he going on holiday? Does he need it? Look, just stick to it, but never mind the nurse, just stick to the profile thing. Okay. Epro dictate letter. I saw this man in the clinic today, full stop. He arrived somewhat unexpectedly without his notes, full stop. As you know, he had a superficial spreading melanoma removed from his left lower calf in May 2008, full stop. He's been well since that time and tells me that he's continuing his regular self-examination, full stop. New paragraph. On examination today, he looked fit and well, full stop. The scar was normal with no evidence of any local or local region or, or distant metastasis, full stop, new paragraph. He also wanted me to look at a pigmented lesion of his back, and on examination there was a 9 by 14 millimeter warty looking lesion, which is almost certainly a basal cell papilloma, full stop. I have reassured him that this is of no consequence. And I've arranged to see him again in one year's time for his regular review. He proceeded the proof. Mr. Blocks, I tried your best to disrupt my clinic, but we have produced a letter for you. Now, that speech recognition working in one way, I didn't check it. Um, I've done the electronic approval, I'm now able to give that to Mr. Bloss to go home. So there's an example of one application of technology to, uh, to uh, produce efficiencies. There was no secretary involved in that. There are other ways of doing speech recognition, and you'll hear more about that later. But this way happens to work well at home. So, remember that uh, this process is um, one that bats around between different people and the talk of the handoff between the different uh, different parties in the process. And this is one of the key benefits of an electronic system. We're going to move now from clinician role to uh, secretary role. And the first letter I give that wasn't done with speech recognition, that needs to be typed up. So I've logged in as a secretary. And uh, I'm going to see my flip uh, slide uh, control, control center, as I call it. I'm not sure if I'm meant to say that, but it seems what it is to me. And as a secretary, I can see all my list of work um, and uh, get on with my typing. 
So I've got my patient here being good, good secretary. I'll choose the one from the top of the list that's been prioritized for me and not cherry pick the easy letters from the lower down. Play it back. So you saw me using some auto text there. So there's an illustration of a transcription. Let's move now back into the role of the clinician who needs to do the electronic sign. The most important thing about electronic sign off for a clinician, at least the thing they will complain about the most, is that it has to be quick. So I've got my list of letters here for signature. Here was the letter that I did on uh, Vera. Uh, Anderson. The one thing that's important about this letter is this part is the only part I typed. All of this other information was populated by the template engine. Hopefully, correctly, from the PAS system, the right GP. I didn't have a referral date, but the other information in this and the title, etc. So you can see that there's again, there's an obvious volatility benefit there, as well as a quality one, because hopefully the letter is not correct. So I want to approve my letter and go straight on to the next letter. Now this letter looks pretty good, except there's just one mistake in it. So if I were an IT-enabled clinician, not for everyone, but it wasn't really very hard to fix that spelling mistake. So I removed the need for the letter to be go back. It didn't have to be printed out, didn't have to go back to the secretary, etc. again. And we do see some doctors are now doing it, don't encourage them to do it. It's best if you let them show you how clever they are by doing it themselves. Secretaries would be doing it for years, but anyway, the doctors think it's clever. So there was the um, approval. The last stage is issuing, and, and we're looking to do this as a batch process and say select our letters, send them out to GP electronically with one click for the whole batch. And we'll see our printed letters, we'll print out the notes if we're doing the, 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 the notes, print out copies of the notes, um, or read the certification sent to the GP electronically, etc. So what's missing from this? Well, reporting. I think you've seen the versions of this uh, report before. So here we're looking at um, the letters which uh, are on target, the blue ones, and then we're comparing what amount of time is spent in the letters that were in target to the ones that were overdue. And this is showing us here that this purple bit is our backlog, which is actually in this case uh, mostly a typing one, and there's a bit of a delay in medicine in uh, how long they took to dictate the letter. But if you can't tell, where the blockage is in the process, it's no good encouraging your secretaries if you've got a week long delay in electronic approval or somebody is not dictating their letters. So, there's a look at um, some uh, technology. What about paperless clinics? Well, I called it paperless, and you know, paperless is the whole holy grail. There's actually a step before that which is really valuable, which is notice. And the question is, can you do that patient clinics without notes, without case notes? Well, why might you want to? The major advantage is the cost of your medical records. And I think Debbie is talking us about to this later. But you know, it varies to trust the trust, but some trusts say 70% of our medical records costs is in ferrying notes around the hospital, pulling them for clinics. And there are big savings you can make if you don't have to do that. There's some other aspects of notes, and if you require your notes in the um, after the clinics, after the clinic, they have to go to the secretary's office, and the secretary's office fills up with notes, and then they have another appointment, they get put to go off somewhere else, and there's just a sort of little process, a car crash that happens every day of the week, um, about that in trusts. So what do you need to do paper, uh, paperless clinics? Well, I've sort of had some ideas here. Number one for me, 
would be previous clinic vaccines. If I know what happened the last time the patient came to see me, that is a big help. Remember, Anna talked about the fact that the letter does not only for the recipient, it also summarizes what was what happened. If it's a new referral, then you need the referral letter, and there are some challenges around that because Tuesday book is a bit of a thing to uh, integrate with. Lab results are very useful, lots of patients come to clinic. How much of a waste is it? If a patient comes to clinic and the test you ordered last time is not ready, you say, well, I can't make a decision because I don't have the information. Electronic lab results, nearly all trusts have access to lab results. Radiology reports and images, particularly important, or Phoenix might argue that that's the only thing. Discharge summaries, well, if a patient has recently been discharged, that's very relevant. And then there's the handwritten notes from the previous clinic or admission. What happens when people come to clinic is that there's a sort of usually a parallel copy. The clinic letter is dictated at the end of the clinic, but most clinicians will write handwritten notes in the, in, in the case notes, which kind of say pretty much the same thing as the letter much of the time, so you could argue why they're doing it, but it's sort of one of those critical <coughs> things. And that's probably the part which is hardest to do. And there are various options around that. I think you may be telling us around uh, scanning or digital pens or um, etc. We do have the capacity in ECO, I can show it to you, to show scan images if, if that's what, uh, to be able to accommodate that. Structure. Well, what does structured information mean? There's this sort of magic phrase, the health informatics bus, of semantic interoperability. What that means is having data in a format that can be understood by machines, really. Patients come to us and they talk in narrative in stories. But computers are very bad at understanding narrative. Humans are very good at it. So we try and introduce structure. We start off with loosely structured letters, so we might say at the top, diagnosis, headaches, management, etc. Although all too often, many letters are similar to the one that Anna showed us and are just a stream of text uh, as either they're not structured. So if we can start introducing structure, there's a number of things we can do with that. We can improve the clarity to people. Interesting to hear from some of last week, we've just got a sequin on this. The PCT require them now to have all letters having a diagnosis section, a medication changes, and a, a third heading that I can't, uh, I can't quite remember. And uh, there's a little bit of a discussion going on with our clinicians, and they were saying, oh, we don't really want to do it like this. And then they admitted that actually they quite like the oncology letters, because culturally oncology have used these headings for years now. So there was kind of a bit of an own goal to the resistance they were coming up with there. And then coding. The real thing about coding is it's more precise and it allows you to start reporting. If you can code your procedures in clinic, then you can get extra money. You can also start doing research and say, who are all my patients with X and Y and Z? And the other big thing about it is it's future proofing. Let's say I have an allergy to amoxicillin. It's one of the penicillins, it's a common allergy. If that is recorded just in free text, and you have an e-prescribing system in the future that does decision support, well, it might match on amoxicillin, but there's lots of other names, drugs with similar cross-reactivities, and if that is not coded properly, that information is virtually useless for the decision support. So that's um, having your information in structured format means that you could drive your, your future systems as they develop and new code. How to do this? Well, I can't tell you all this in the time today, but we suggest an incremental approach. I would suggest that you start off, and this is something all of you can do now, irrespective of whether you have a technology system. Just make laminated cards and put them in applications and talk to the relevant people to get agreement to say when you start your letters, dictate them with the patient name, you need that, and then say diagnosis, da 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 da. That single field can be very powerful in terms of how you go forward. And it's an easy first step to do dictate a free text diagnosis. 
From there, you might go into a more structured template and say, dictated the form of diagnosis, a series of headings, etc. We tried to solve this problem in Birmingham in about 2003. Where we got to was um, in one department, and we identified a list of 30 coding diagnoses. They were already doing that point, and we were able to work out what the common diagnoses were, and we just identified a list of 30 with another option, and the secretaries were able to pick the uh, diagnosis off the list. The other option is important because it's much better to have 100% coding with 5% that say other than to say, oh, I've only got 72% and I don't really know what the others are. That just wrecks all the stats. You can move on to clinicians picking from a similar list as they start to integrate with the computers. You can link with repositories. If you have an e-prescribing solution in your hospital, you have probably a list of medications. So, wouldn't it be good if you could just import that list of current medication in the letter, having updated it if necessary? Well, that's technologically possible, and that is proper structured data. And then there's a the very holy grail, which is look at my letter and do automated free text analysis, which is technologically challenging and probably a few years away yet. I just wanted to show you something about keywords. When we do the document import, we index all the documents. And it's possible to search them for keywords. So in this example, someone searched for diabetes and gastroparesis, which uh, Mr. Bloggs happened to have. And you can see we picked up all the letters um, which have those keywords. And that can be quite quick. Suffer, we have now uh, 2.2 million letters, and we can search them all in 10 seconds. What about me? Well, I put this step at the end, but it isn't really. This needs to go all the way through the process. Now, I kind of regret the fact that in the NHS, we do lean a little bit far past it. Lean comes from the car manufacturing industry, Toyota, and it's a complete culture. It affects how people think. And that's why I said culture, culture, culture. You need to look at the whole process. I think we have an example from one of our trusts at Wolverhampton, is it Colin? Colin Howard and Ezra, the relationship manager for Wolverhampton, um, they analysed that process and they reduced the number of discrete steps from, I think, about 23 to 11. Now, that's a great piece of work, but the message about me is it's not just a one off exercise. You have to keep going back, you have to keep improving, you have to stop backtracking, things change. And so, LEAP is a whole topic in itself. Um, it's had some airtime in uh, uh, the NHS recently, but we haven't really embraced it as much as we could. I've shown you six principles. Oh, so yes, there is an element of the where we're just looking at um, how patients arrive to clinic. These little icons down the side, in fact, integrated with a patient self checking system. We can see who's arrived being seen. This patient is 35 minutes late for their appointment, etc. So you can start looking at the flow of patients from the clinics. You can do self checkings with uh, things like Samuel's products. You can look at your DNA rate. Why are people difficult, not turning up to clinic, did not attend? Uh, you can send SMS text reminders. You can allow patients to book their own appointments, apart from Tuesday World, which has its issues. Um, so there's lots of things you can do about the whole process. Okay, so those were seven areas we looked at. People do things in different orders. They all have different things to add, different fit to trusts. We're going to hear about a number of them later today. Um, did we get to heaven? Well, I don't know. Um, that side was really a few for questions. I'm not sure how we're doing for time. Now, I think we're probably out of time for questions. So, um, I'm around, Andrew is around, we've got a question and panel thing later. Um, one of the main aims of us having a conference here is for you to share experience with each other. Because, hey, we have expertise, we've got it from you. We do have real people here today from trusts. We have Sutton at the back who were one of the first, they went down the framework route route first with EPRO. We have big lots of people from Leeds in the middle, they're on speech recognition 
and we're also in the process of doing quite a significant secretarial restructuring. We have people from Leeds at the front who are probably the only people here doing paper estimates. And maybe, I think it's probably fair to say that they've got a pretty legal process now. We have all the possible as well ourselves. Um, so there's a number of trusts here, and uh, we encourage you, if you've not done this stuff yet, or you've not done the other bit, then go and talk to each other and share ideas. Thank you very much.